If you enjoy these programs, please like and subscribe. What are really Messianic Jews? They are inverted Muranos. The Inquisition was to determine who were those Jews who were secretly living as Jews, but outwardly they are Christians. What's the Messianic movement? They are outwardly Jewish and inwardly Christian. What happens to the Jews who have gone into the Messianic movement in the church? What happens they to are Jews? going not only going in that church, they are worshiping Jesus. That means the Messianic movement is Christianity, okay? Right. It's just the thing we don't say. Okay? Right, it is so Christianity. Me messianic Christianity right. is Christianity. Yes, yes. And the reason there are so many sects of the Messianic movement is because there's so many sects of Protestant Christianity. So just as there are charismatic Christians like Assemblies of God, so there are Messianic churches that are Assemblies of God. There are Correct. Southern Baptist Messianic congregation. They're against, they don't, they don't believe in that stuff. So what's your question? You know that it's just a... Well, my thought is, what you had said about a Jew going into a church and the level of sin. And so I what you. happens, I know you're trying to pull them out of yes. the church and they got sucked into the, Christ, the Christian messianic movement. The messianic movement is a sect that was developed in the early 1970s to the way the iteration that we see it today. There were messianic congregations, Hebrew Christian alliances prior to that, but it exploded in 1973. That's why 73 is called Key 73. What are really messianic Jews? Now you have to listen very carefully, you need all your brains. They are inverted Muranos. This is sort of gonna sweep across the room. They are inverted Muranos. What are Muranos? Conversos. These were Jews who were forced to convert to Christianity. Outwardly, they had to look Christian, but inwardly, they were still Jewish. The term Murano was an unflattering term used to describe such people, and it was up to the Inquisition to find out who these people are. The Inquisition was not interested in finding me because a Jew who never got baptized, that was fine. It wasn't fine, but it was, that, the Inquisition was to determine who were those Jews who were secretly living as Jews, but outwardly they are Christians. What's the Messianic movement? The Messianic movement is the exact inverse of that. They are outwardly Jewish and inwardly Christian. It's idolatry and they simply reflect the denomination, denominations with whom they associate. So as I said, if a Messianic congregation is Southern Baptist, so they don't speak in tongues because the Southern Baptist Church believes that that gift has ceased, and that's the term used, and so on. But it is, it is the most vile idolatry because it is the chazer, it is the pig. The Torah tells us in Leviticus chapter 11, first of all, it identifies what animals are, land animals are clean, and marine life, what marine, it tells us the laws of kosher animals, clean animals. And Torah does something really strange, really strange. Will you want to go a little high? Okay, good. So Torah says that for land animals, there are two signs so that you know what is a clean animal? What's a clean animal? It has to have two signs. Number, it has to have mafresis parsa and male gera, which means it has to have split hooves. Now, male gera is translated as what? It really doesn't mean that. Male gera, because a rabbit doesn't chew its cud. 
but it does eat its own droppings to redigest, okay? So at Malegera, it brings it up and turns it over again. The animals who do this very efficiently are the animals you're familiar with, the cows. They're, they have four stomachs. The first one ferments, brings it back up, and they're chewing thousands and thousands of times. It's a brilliant system. That's why they could eat grass and derive, extract the nutrition. For us, it would be a, we were not able to do that, okay? So it has to have these two signs. It has to have split hooves and chew his cud. The tyrant then does something odd. Whenever the tyrant does something odd, you have to say, let's find out why Hashem does this. The tyrant says that of the animals that chew their cud and do not have split hooves, you may not eat them. And the Torah identifies which animals those are. The, uh, as an example, the, the camel, it chews its cud, it doesn't have split hooves. If it has split hooves, it would sink in the sand. The rabbit, the hare. The Torah then says, and there's one animal, there's one animal that has split hooves and does not chew its cud, and that's the chazir, it's the pig. And the pig, it's, it's an abomination for you. You may not eat it. So the, Gemara, the Talmud asks the question, what do we need this for? That means if all we had was any animal that does not have both a split hose and chew its cud is unclean, would I need to have this other information? No, I don't, why would I need it for? The Torah wants you to know that who is the author behind this, because as it turns out, taking the pig, it's the only animal that has split hooves that does not chew its cud. In fact, in Jewish law, if you're walking in a forest, let's say you're in a jungle in Indonesia or Malaysia, and you, you come upon a creature you've never seen before, you're a shochet, you have your knife with you, but you don't know if it's a clean animal or not. So the halach is, the law is, that the first thing is you look at the feet. Does it have split hooves? If it does, and you know what a pig looks like, look at its face. If it's not a pig, you could slaughter it. Got it? Okay. So the pig stands out. And what does the pig do? Look at my fieselach. It has its feet stuck out. You know, on a, on, a, on a cow, to see the split hoof, you have to kind of get in there to see it, right? You got to like get in there. But a pig, it's, very, it's like wearing high heel purple shoes, you know, <laughs> by Versace. Give a look at me. That's what Christianity is. Look at my, look at my split hooves. But when you open it up, it's all treif, it's not kosher. And these four animals are the four kingdoms. Those of you who listen to me know very well, the first three kingdoms, Babylon, really is a male gera. It turns everything over to the bear, to Persia. The, the lion doesn't die, if you notice. What happens to the lion? Its wings are removed and it's given a what? Impress me. It's given the heart of a man. A lion's heart is five times the size of a human heart. Why does a lion require such an enormous heart? It can run like the wind, it can weigh hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilos, and it needs to be able to live that mess. What would happen to a lion if we would put a human heart in the lion? It wouldn't die, it wouldn't be able to move. It would, it would crawl because its heart could no longer pump all that oxygen that's required. So when the Navi says, when the Holy Navi says that it's giving the, the lion the heart of a human, what it means is it's now bubble is destroyed. But it's not like destroyed, it's still around, it just can't move anymore. When America defeated King George III, America retained all the good stuff from Britain, it didn't get rid of it. I like the English language, we'll keep that, <laughs> right? So they kept the good stuff. So that's what, it kept rolling over, rolling over, rolling. The Chazir is the end, that's Edom, that's the fourth kingdom, and that has to be utterly destroyed. And that's why the pig, although not its meat, technically is not more unkosher than horse meat, it's not. But it represents everything that's evil because it has split hooves. Look how kosher I am, but inside it's a chazer. That's the messianic movement. If you enjoy these programs, please like and subscribe. <laughs> אזי מלך, אזי מלך, שמו נקרא, ואחרי כיכלות הכל, 
לבדו, ימלוך נורא.